Hello and welcome back to another episode of Ride Rescue. After the last failed attempt <laughs> to paint uh, the Buick, uh, back for another round. The first time I painted the car, my plan was to paint all the back half, the body, the doors, the trunk lid, the jams, do everything all at once so that there would be a, a seamless transition from the edges of the doors. And then I could put the front clip on and mask off all the back half of the car and paint all the front clip and try to eliminate as much overspray as possible. Well, after that failed attempt and ended up with all the metallic starting to settle in places on the car, I'm back for another round. So this time I've decided I'm just going to leave the jams, the doors, um, all of the around the trunk lid. I'll leave that area, mask it all off. And take the risk of getting overspray and just having to take the extra care in polishing all those areas if they do get any overspray. Uh, one of the things that's nice about doing it this way is if I'm putting the front clip on and the hood on and end up chipping up the edges of the doors, which I did, <laughs> then it's easy to go back and, and fix, touch those areas up, smooth them out, and then put on the final coat of paint. So while I was at it, I'm aligning the front fenders and the hood, getting everything, all the lines, all the gaps perfect, I decided to fit the front bumper and make sure that the bumper also fits. And before I did the bumper for the final fitment, I decided to send it out for chroming. That ended up being a really good idea. I'm glad I did. Because my chrome guys, even though I put notes all over them, that these are custom shapes Please don't take them back to stock shape. They did. So I ended up doing a lot of chipping around the back bumper, around the front fenders, trying to get these shapes back the way they were. Uh, the back bumper uh, took a big heavy mallet, uh, a, a dead blow type mallet, a rubber mallet, blocks of wood, a lot of tape and was able to get the back bumper reshaped without any damage, any cracks in the chrome. It was pretty amazing that I was able to get that to fit again. Uh, the front bumper, I wasn't so successful <laughs> to get the shapes. The edges of the front bumpers were, were out on the originally manufactured shape. So to pull those in, where the V-shape was at the tops of those fenders, I ended up cracking the chrome. It is tucked underneath the fenders, so I thought, well, I'll take the chance. I, I dabbed in some silver paint underneath the cracks and coated it as much as possible, hoping that I wouldn't have to, but I got a hold of my, my chrome guy, and he said they will re-chrome them for me if there's any issues. So I thought, I'll, with this go around, I'll leave them and I'll get everything fitted and make sure that I don't end up having any other issues. So now that I've got everything aligned the way I want it, um, all my edges are clean, all the touch-ups, smoothing, I ended up having to re-sand one of the front fenders, the passenger side front fender. When I put it on and I bolted down the inner fender well, it popped in at the top of the fender well lip. And to get that back out, I was really worried I was going to have to go back to doing filler, but it's kind of like the oil can effect where it, it ended up popping back out and then stayed there and it was solid. So there was something just strange about the, putting the inner fender well back in. I was able to, to, to smooth that back out and just sand the primer and the filler just a little bit and it was ready for another coat of, of a primer sealer surfacer. So that's where I need to just sand and finish everything on the front end, go back over all the painted surface and, and sand and smooth all of that. And it's ready for paint again. So this round of paint, I wanted to make sure I was not going to get any dust or have any lighting issues. So I covered all the floor of my garage with white cardboard. And then I covered all of the walls with white cardboard. And I cut a doorway because it's a three-car garage. I put the car in the garage on the two-car side on an angle and then I had my third car garage separated so that I could put in a 
a paper doorway, if you will, into the third car garage, and that's where I had my air compressor, and I had filters and fans, everything set up that on that side, and I was able to then go in there, mix my paint, get everything set up just like you would a regular paint booth, and then go into my paint booth area, tape up the doorway, and paint. With all the, the lighting in that paint area and all the white surface reflecting, it was so much better than the first time around. Plus, I was able to get started earlier in the day and I had everything set up with all my paint and my different blends and my mixes that uh, I was able to, to keep going and keep painting and go through all the different cycles much quicker this go around and not have to worry about the, the temperature changes uh, as drastic as it was the first time around. Uh, so again, I'll kind of go over what I did paint-wise. Um, first coat was a 25% color and a 75% mix of clear coat. After the first coat, I go with a 50-50 paint and clear. Then the third coat is a 75-25 clear. And then 100% clear for two heavy, heavy coats. So the last two coats, I tried to put on fairly heavy, tried to get it to flow. Um, especially the very last coat, I thinned it a little bit more so that it would flow a little bit better. And I could mist it on better. And it worked out really good. As you can see from the pictures, there's a real good high gloss. It has that deep, rich coat that I was after. Along the bottom of the car, from the belt line down, that's where I went back in uh, just before the clear coat, and I misted it with a, a mixture of about 25% dark gray metallic and the clear. And I did that probably three, maybe even four coats of blending uh, where I went fairly high with the first coat and then a little lower with the next coat and a little bit lower with the other coat um, until I got into the the fourth coat and I was just really misting the lower end of the car and gave it a real dark gradual color change that really looked good give it that the fustade I let the paint cure for a good 24 hours before I unmasked it uh, peel up all the masking, cleaned everything up. Uh, I pull it out into the sun, let it bake really good. Then it was time to start putting a few things back on the car. And once I was comfortable that I had a good, solid, hard, clear finish, then it was time to color sand. With all the coats, coats after coats after coats of paint that I would put onto the car, I was getting some orange peel. Uh, probably a little heavier than you normally would with a base coat clear coat but since it was so thick and i had so much material on the car i was able to just really flatten the car out normally i would start out with about a thousand grit to 1500 grit sandpaper but because the orange pill was fairly heavy and the clear coat was fairly heavy to really knock it down it was taking forever with thousand grit sandpaper so I dropped back to 600 grit sandpaper. Most people would say never go 600 grit sandpaper because you're going to leave a lot of scratch and you're going to take off a lot of material. You do have to be really careful around all the edges, anything where you have a high spot on any, any body lines, um, fender wheel lips, you can cut through that so quick. So all the flat panels, the hood, the trunk lid, the sides, I used 600 grit sandpaper on just the flat areas and knocked it down quick and then went around all the edges and all the rest of the areas of the car with 1000 grit sandpaper and then 2000 grit sandpaper, 3000 grit sandpaper and 5000 grit sponge pads. By taking it all flat in all the areas with 5000 grit, it's ready for buff and it doesn't take a whole lot of buff. So I use a wool pad buff the whole car and then used, I actually had three colors of foam pads and I used Meguiar's um, cut and polish with three different grits of Meguiar's. So it was a heavy cut, a fine cut, swirl remover, and then a polish. And as you can see from these pictures, wow, did it turn out good. Just so rich, so deep, and so smooth. 
all that effort of making those body panels perfectly flat really shows now with this paint. So, so with this perfect, beautiful mirror finish on the car, now I'm excited to get it all back together. Uh, I'm re-chroming the grill. Um, the headlight bezels I was going to chrome, I was able to find a set of new old stock. So they're beautiful headlight bezels, no need to chrome those. The rear view mirrors had a little bit of pitting, so I sent those out for chroming. Uh, the tail panel had some pitting, so I sent that out as well. The grill, I shopped and shopped and shopped for grills. I probably spent six, seven years looking for a perfect grill. <laughs> and after buying three different grills and taking them all to the chrome shop, I had purchased a grill for $10 on eBay that looked smooth but had horrible chrome. And I was shocked that the chrome guy said, there's no pitting in this and the chrome is so poor it'll actually come off really smooth and then we can re-chrome it with very little effort. And it was amazing. That grill was beautiful way better than anything you'd get as a new old stock or even a factory grill. It really was nice. Since my chrome supplier ended up making a mess of my bumpers and I had to go through all the work of reshaping them, they made me a fantastic deal on re-chroming all my pop metal. They re-chromed everything for half price because of what they put me through with the bumpers. So it, it ended up being a pretty good deal because I could have easily had $20,000 in chrome work. Uh, and in the next video, I'll uh, show what I did with all that chrome work. Uh, I did some paint combinations with the chrome. Um, I did some detail work that was, <laughs> was risky, <laughs> but it really looked good uh, and, and is taking this show car to a higher level. As I had mentioned in the past on my other videos, uh, I've been keeping you up to date on costs, and I kind of set the cost aside when I was doing all the body work, um, the final body work, the, the paint work, the primer, the sanding, and so now's the time to reveal that. <laughs> Since I purchased all my paint from Summit Racing as a single stage paint, the paint was a lot less expensive than a base coat, clear coat. So I'm into the paint total, after painting the car twice, of $1,120. So it's, it's a lot of money, but it's not as much money as it would have been if I had a purchased Sherwin-Williams. I looked at Sherwin-Williams paint and I would probably be $2,500 to $3,000 in materials. I don't know if I'd do it again. Uh, it, it's a neat effect, but it, the, the Summit paint I hate to say didn't go down as well as a, a higher end paint. I painted with Sherwin Williams a lot with the base coat clear coat. And the clear does go down much smoother. It probably would have saved me a lot of work in, in color sanding and smoothing and polishing. But I don't regret it. Uh, the look and especially the fade that comes down all the way along the bottom of the car, it did turn out fantastic. It was an experience. <laughs> so, the labor though, wow, was it a lot of labor. To get all those panels that flat and then to have to cut and polish all of those flat areas to get that mirror finish, I have a lot of hours into this car. So the total hours from primer to paint and aligning all the panels and getting everything perfectly smooth before I'm even putting the car back together is 638 hours. If you were to be paying a shop, I'm just figuring $50, $55 per hour shop time for doing it myself. That's $35,000 in shop time. <laughs> you can see that would really add up fast. All total with all the parts, the cost of the car, and then all of my labor, I am $83,000 into this car. And as you can see, I'm not finished yet. I still have to put on a top, finish the chrome, and put in an interior. So yeah, this car is easily going to surpass six figures if I was to take it to a shop and just drop it off. My total out of pocket, I'm just over $20,000 into the car. 
So I'm still way below what the value of this car is. It is going to be a top-notch show car. It's going to be perfect. If you just look at what the value of a 64 Skylark convertible is worth, restored, the value is right about there with what I'm into the car. But when this car is finished, in the right hands, in the right market, the car should be in the sixty to seventy thousand dollar range, I would think, when, as a show car, as a custom car. There are shops that build cars, and that's what they do for a living, and they're getting those kind of dollars. But I don't see myself ever getting those kind of dollars out of that car. But I'm not building it to sell. I'm building it to enjoy. I'm building it to drive it, uh, take it to car shows, and really have a lot of fun with it. So thanks for watching this episode of Ride Rescue. Hit that subscribe button, share it, give me a like, give me a thumbs up. Really appreciate you tuning in. You can check out my channel and see my other videos that I've done. I've still got other videos that I'm going to be working on. Pontiac is one of them. I know, I've said that before on my other videos. It is coming. <laughs> There's a lot of work that I've been doing on the video. I've got some hands-on video. It's not just the pictures like I've been doing on these. Uh, so I look forward to getting those out. Well, thanks again for watching.